ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining uh, the second last uh, keynote of the day uh, keep those thumbs uh, thumbs up coming we love that jeff loves those uh, <laughs> Again, Jeff is someone who really does not need an introduction. He's uh, he's a true legend, uh, someone that I have uh, had the pleasure of working very closely with. Uh, I always tell people that he's he's been a role model for me, true inspiration. Uh, and the most shameful moment for me was sharing the stage with him when we uh, both got the Gordian Pask Award uh, in two thousand seven. <laughs> oh, no rash! All right, we need to talk about that. That was a, an honor for me. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, uh, been been a true honor to uh, to work with him, to learn from him, be influenced by him. Some of his work on bringing user centered design into agile, and now more broadly, the whole product thinking into agile has just been phenomenal. I think the the originality of the work that Jeff does. Uh, is just unbelievable. I remember having so many conversations with him where he'll sit down, he'll take a paper napkin, he'll just draw something, and you're like, "Holy moly!" Like Jeff, how 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 did you think about that? And uh, it's just amazing uh, to see that kind of a depth. And we need uh, all that wisdom from you, Jeff. Today, you're gonna <laughs> suck it out of your brain. Uh, <laughs> so, without taking too much time, uh, I give uh, Jeff Patton to you. Thank you, Narash. All right, I need to share a screen. We're recording, correct? Yes, we are. So you want to kickstart your um, uh, screen sharing? You can see my screen. Let me make sure my picture is back on. And you can see my hands. I can ask you how many fingers am I holding up, and you can see, see? that. Great. Now oh. I'm going to go back and forth between drawing pictures. I don't have napkins anymore. I've got a little bit better paper than Naresh just talked about. I'm here to talk about product thinking. I've been talking about product thinking ever since I started in software development. And it's, uh, it, look, I started my career in the late 1980s, early 1990s, working for a small product company. And I learned software development there, that way. And I, working for a product company is pretty cool. Uh, generally, people are pretty happy and pretty focused. Not always happy, but at least focused because everybody's working towards a common outcome. Now, I thought this is the way software development worked. It wasn't until, oh, in the mid-2000s that I joined a, a big consultancy and I started working with larger companies and banks and insurance companies and other people uh, that I realized people don't have uh, product thinking isn't built in to their organization or their culture and people work differently. What I want to talk about is the mindset, and you've got to walk away from here recognizing when you've got a product mindset and when you don't, and what you can do about it, because even the biggest companies fall out of the uh, of this product mindset. Now, I've got a quick question for you, and I'm going to drop back to text here. Uh, what makes a product great? Let me see if I can pull up this uh, discuss. If I ask the question, uh, if I ask the question, what makes a product great or, or what makes it uh, successful? What are the first words that come to mind? And you know, tell me anything that comes to mind. I see uh, users love it, usability, value. Um, now I'm not going to be able to keep up. Uh, Value usability uh, it solves the user problem, fulfills the needs of the customer. It fulfills a need, it's value, commercial, monetary success. I, uh, it's early for me. My handwriting is... Uh, Terrible. Uh, it'll it'll get better over time. Uh, makes life easier. And uh, usefulness. Uh, it makes users awesome. I'm gonna, gonna get that one. Okay. That's you said more um, than I could write down anyway. But you get the idea. What I'm look watching for, and let me put uh, yeah, uh, quality in there. I saw that. And uh, emotional res uh, resonance. Oh, my gosh. I can't stop uh, writing these. 
Now, I want to point out that nobody said finished on time or delivered under budget, that those are not product concerns. Now, there's a model I draw every time, and I want to redraw just enough of it so that you can so that I can put this stuff into context. In software development, we spend a lot of time building software. Of course, we start with ideas. Uh, if we're building a whole new product, the idea could be for a product. If you've got an existing product, those ideas are often for those features or enhancements. Those are the things that in software development we start referring to as our requirements. And yeah, people have heard me say this before. Anybody who's heard me talk has. We're trying to turn these ideas in, um, well, into working software. Uh, we, we're turning dollars into software to start with. And since we're turning dollars into software, we worry about the time it's going to take. Um, we worry about the cost. The, the cost doesn't pay for raw materials. It pays for people, humans, all of you listening to build this software. And then all this stuff is called scope. We spend a lot of time worrying about time, cost, and scope. And everybody knows if you're building software or building technology for a living, this is the this, this unbreakable, annoying triangle is the bad news triangle. It's bad news because you want to know what you can get, how long it's going to take, and what's going to cost, but you can't. There's an old rule that you can know any two. If you fix the time and the scope, then the bad news is going to cost more. You fix the time and the cost, and the bad news is you're going to get less scope. And you fix all three, the bad news is there's actually four. The fourth one is uh, quality. Fix all three, and quality squeezes out like toothpaste in a toothpaste tube. But none of this is what matters. What matters to make a product successful is, well, what your, what your customers uh, and users do and say. Uh, look, we hope that when we ship this thing that they will see it, they will try it, they will use it. We hope that they keep using it. And we hope that they say good things. And when I ask you what makes a product great, these are the kinds of good things that, that people say. It's all this stuff uh, that we're looking for. Now, uh, look, all products aren't consumer products. By that, I mean there are B2B products or things that we build for internal use. And we don't have to worry about whether people will see, try, use, and keep using it because they have to. It's their job. But, uh, you know, while we can make them use it, we cannot make them say good things. And then we look for other qualities like whether they become more efficient or more effective. Uh, by efficient, I mean able to do more work, effective, doing better work. Uh, those are the things that we look for. If we don't get those things, our product isn't great. It isn't successful. And well, we've got all these things that our customers and users do. And but the, the point is, you know, <laughs> You all work for companies or organizations, and your organization does, does not pay its bills with happy customers. It pays its bills with money. Your organization needs to sustain itself, and to do that, it needs cash, and it pays attention to revenue and metrics, and there are people inside that watch that. And when enough people see, try, use, and keep using it, well, that's when we get that commercial or monetary success. That's when we see things like ROI or lots of people say good things. That helps our brand uh, awareness. If lots of people tell each other and more people buy, that helps our market share or how we do against our competitors. Your customers don't, uh, ROI doesn't solve one of their problems. It doesn't fulfill one of their needs. It doesn't make them happy. ROI is what your company needs to sustain itself. Uh, we turn cash into software, and then we turn that software back into cash. And the way we do it is through this mechanism in the middle. Now, I draw this thing all the time because I want people to separate what we build, the output, from what we're focusing on when we think about products. And that's the outcome. And outcome is measured in what your customers and users do and say. This is super annoying. Our success is not what we do. It's what they do. And if they don't do it, we're not successful. And if enough of them don't do it, we don't get this business impact. Impact comes as a consequence, and we measure impact inside, back inside the walls of our business. That's what matters. Look, now everybody knows that, uh, that products are successful because, well, because of what our customers and users do. Uh, 
but yet we spend so much time worrying about time, cost, and scope. Now, I want to change things uh, a little bit, and I want to talk about a different kind of business, one where that time, cost, and scope kind of matters a lot more. Now, I realize a lot of listeners are in India. I know that we've got some listeners that are in Europe or other places. I live in the United States. I live in a city called Park City, Utah. Park City is it's high up in the mountains, and uh, there are lots of there are ski resorts here, things like that. And I'm lucky. I got a lot of space. And uh, and Arush has seen this, but not for a while. This is my backyard, or at least it, it was a, f- uh, a month or so ago. My backyard was normally kind of uh, crappy grass and a lot of trees, and it's not really been usable. So this year we've invested in landscaping. We've had somebody come in with lots of equipment and uh, level big parts of it. They brought in a lot of stone. They've uh, done this stonework and created this patio. And uh, the the guy that I hired, look, this is Troy. He's my landscaper. He uh, has a team of people. And I have a completely different question for you is, and that's what makes a landscaper great. So let's let me flip back and make sure I can see what you're doing. I want to ask the exact same question. Sorry, let's see if I can do this. Uh, uh, look, if I were to ask you the question, what, what if, if you had to hire someone to do landscaping for you, and not all of you uh, have property to do that, uh, let, let me, good, you've got it. Uh, it, it delivers, uh, delivers on time, what makes you happy? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't write as fast. Uh, d- delivers to my needs, satisfying customer needs, uh, quality. Uh, listens to you, sustainability. Um, and I wonder what you mean by sustainability. Maybe in the materials and things like that. Fits the budget. Uh, um, Uh, somebody said um, uh, drawings or um, prototypes, things that let me be sure I'm getting what I want. Uh, you know, yeah, cost. Uh, and by cost, you probably don't mean high cost. Uh, you mean moderate cost. Uh, it, it creates beauty, <laughs> completes on time. Um, all right. You, I've missed some good things in there because I had my head down writing. Uh, uh, um, people said on time a couple times. I'm going to uh, get that in there. That's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm having fun reading these things uh, and I can't write them all. You get it. Now, let me explain the landscaping business to you because, uh, well, it shouldn't be like the software business, but the, the way the landscaping business works is, is this. Um, I'm a customer. And I, uh, I have a need. I have a need that I, I can't fulfill myself. So I need to find a, a landscaper or someone who can do this. In this case, uh, well, I ended up with Troy. I ended up talking with a lot of people. And Troy has a, a full uh, team of people to do things, people that do stonework and uh, run that equipment that's in my backyard, things like that. And I explained to Troy what I want. Uh, his job is to listen and to uh, understand. Now, uh, you, know, you guys said listens and understands, and well, he's got to create beauty. And so we go back and forth uh, with this description because he ultimately needs to uh, figure out uh, what uh, we're going to build, how uh, we're going to build it, and more really importantly, how how much it's all going to cost. And he will give me back an estimate. Now, this is where in the process I throw a WTF exception. The estimate is always more than I thought. I know uh, look, I, there's a lot of things I want and I've got a, a budget, but I don't know what's possible. I'm not a landscaper. I don't know how much this stuff costs. And even though I gave him sort of a budget, it still was just really high. This uh, causes me to stress. And we go back and in, we go into this mode I'm going to call negotiation, where we go back and forth. During negotiation, my goal is to get as much, you know, as I can or as I can uh, afford. 
um, uh, I'm focused on, on my budget and it, I would love it uh, if he gave me everything for free or, uh, but the problem is Troy has to worry about, well, he has to make money. So he can't give me everything for free. He's got to pay all these people. He's got to pay for all these materials and he needs to buy a bigger boat and a bigger house. And look, he wants to make money, but he also needs to keep uh, his customers happy. Uh, so look, he's thinking of those things while we're in negotiation at some point in time, we agree on what we're going to build. I place an order, and in this situation, I, I, we agree on it. Uh, we it, I give him some money, and he gets a job, gets to work, and he does the job. He worries about the time frames we agreed to. He worries about uh, what we agreed to do, the scope, and he worries about the the cost. And uh, all along the way, he's worrying about the quality also. He, he uh, delivers what we agree to. He focuses on doing it on time. He focuses on keeping it beautiful. And, and those are the things he's doing. Now, during this whole process, there are problems. Uh, you know, he couldn't predict everything. We've had situations where there are where cables buried in our yard that we didn't anticipate. So the original design didn't work unless we moved those cables and it was going to be too costly. Um, and every time things kind of uh, weren't what he predicted, we'll go back up into negotiation, go back up and question those estimates. And we go up and down this stack an awful lot. Uh, one day, Troy cut my Internet cable. And uh, this sucked. I was working and my internet went completely down. Uh, he apologized. He rushed electricians out to fix it. It was back within an hour or so. Uh, but I didn't pay for that. That was his mistake. And because he's making money, he's, it comes out of his profit. And then, well, at the end, my, my yard is still not done. It's closer to done, but I'm hoping for a delivery. Now, I'm drawing this whole process because it should look very familiar. In fact, let me uh, title the top line uh, requirements because this is the process that most organizations work with. This is the process I can almost guarantee that your company follows. Uh, in fact, in most organizations, look, if I relabel this, uh, the business and this uh, IT, uh, the business gives requirements, IT gives estimates, business is never happy with those estimates and then we go into some negotiation mode and business is trying to get as much as they can for their budget and places in order, things go wrong, it, it causes us to pop the stack, go back up to estimates and uh, deal with complaints and then we eventually do, do, do a delivery. That's the process we use. In, in fact, if you look at agile development off the shelf, I remember I started with an agile process called XP or extreme programming. My business card said product manager, but in XP, I was referred to as the customer or I was fulfilling the customer role. Uh, in, in some cases, look, if we, I could write the word PO or product owner here, or product manager, and I could write team over here and product manager builds a backlog, brings what they want into the sprint planning session, team estimates, there's some negotiation. At the end of sprint planning, we agree on what we're going to build. We do the work. And at the end of the sprint, we do a delivery and we take a look at what we uh what we're doing now we end up focusing on all of these qualities the annoying thing is we're not focusing on all of these qualities and this starts to be the fundamental difference between what product thinkers are focusing on and and, and what we end up focusing on now the most this these are all these things matter you do have to if you don't deliver any output then there's no outcome uh, we absolutely need to do this stuff predictably, but it's not the thing that matters most. And if we focus too much on this stuff, this model does not work in your organization. This model works for Troy because of this one thing here, because of this making money thing. The way Troy makes money is he sells time. Uh, because he's selling time, if he has too much work, all he has to do is hire more people. Every single person he hires, he marks up their time and makes more money. It's an awesome business model. If he has way too much work, he can hire more people. If he has way too much work, well, he can, uh, let me write these down. He can hire more people. Uh, he, can, he can just turn down work. And uh, the other thing he can do is he can raise prices. 
and raised prices will cause uh, some customers to go away and allow him to make more money on the customers that he can afford to work with. What's interesting is I can almost guarantee, now some of you may work for agencies, things like that, but if you work for a product company, your company does not make money selling time. If I'm using Spotify or Amazon, I am not buying developer time. I'm buying a product. And if I sign up for Spotify, I'm not going to uh, judge Spotify by whether they're delivering the features I want on time. I'm going to judge Spotify by these product characteristics. This functioning, let me relabel this, uh, this IT as a service model is the one that I see cast into companies and fundamentally changing the way we work and think. Let's see if I can position this a little bit. The important thing for you to understand here is Troy is my backyard is not a product. Uh, it, it's my backyard. It's what I asked for. Uh, and it, it fulfills my vision. Uh, I'm going to evaluate Troy on these capabilities. And at the end of this job, Troy is not the owner of the product. I am. It's my product. I paid for it. And look, one of the things going into my yard is this cool gas fire pit. We get a lot of snow here. It's very cold. And I can turn on this fire pit and we can go out there in the winter and it's going to be fabulous. Now, uh, I like his design and it looks good. But when that fire pit goes in, if I see it, try it and use it, and then I decide it's kind of dumb and I don't keep using it, it is not Troy's problem. It's not his fault. He is not responsible for this outcome. Uh, that's, uh, it's not Troy's product. And if there's more maintenance on this product, it, well, it's mine. I have to pay for it. But the annoying thing in IT sometimes is IT builds a product and then they do end up owning maintenance of it. Uh, they do end up owning it, oddly. So a lot of things that make this a dysfunctional model, but the, the biggest single one is when we use this model inside of our organization, this is not the way your organization makes money. The way your organization converts that code into cash is this way, if it's building a product. Now, let's talk about uh, where I see that things go wrong is people starting to use or think that, well, let's be clear about this. Uh, when you're paying for custom work, the service provider is the product. Troy and his team is the product. That's the thing I look, uh, I look at Troy and his team's qualities to hire him, not the product qualities. So uh, when you start acting like a service provider, just be clear, you are the product. The thing you're building is no longer the product. And what's more is the process you're using may be treating you like the product. Now, I mentioned this about Agile development, and you need to be aware the Agile Manifesto was written in 2001. It, look, it's 20 years since then. Agile is now the default process, but it was written from a service provider's mindset meaning the people who wrote this in 2001, well, they were consultants and other people, and they, they had this IT as a service model in their heads. This is why you see values like customer collaboration over contract negotiation. I want to be able to collaborate with somebody like Troy. I want to make sure that we're on the same page. And when things change or go wrong, we want to work together. If you're on either side of that, that's a better working relationship. When you're paying for custom work, that's what works. But I don't negotiate with Netflix, Spotify, Amazon, uh, Atlassian. Uh, I buy the product. Uh, and there's not a negotiation over the price and definitely not a negotiation over the features that I'm going to, that they're going to add for me. That value just doesn't make sense from a product context. And then look, the first principle in the Agile Manifesto is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Now, uh, that's great if you're in the software delivery business, but uh, Amazon's not in the software delivery business and Netflix isn't in the software delivery business and uh, Geo in India isn't in the software delivery business. Uh, this, the, these are, that's not the thing. If you were a landscaper, I could rewrite that from a landscaper's perspective and say our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of beautiful landscaping. That works. 
I want you to feel when you're acting like a, a service provider, uh, when, uh, when you're treating the product owner like the customer, your business stakeholder like the customer, and you're not paying attention to actual customers. And then I'll, look, I want to give you a few ways to recognize or at least smell when you're acting like the product. And I want to give you a few things you can do to stop acting like the product. So the, the first tell is that you and your team are evaluated based on the velocity of your work or all those service provider characteristics. Uh, don't mistake velocity for actual value. Value is comes from those outcomes. They come after things come out. Uh, so, But if all your organization is looking at are all those service provider qualities, then that's starting to be a problem. You're the product. If someone outside your team decides what you'll build and you rely on their approval before considering the work done, well, then your team is kind of the product. Uh, uh, just like Troy relies on me deciding what to build and relies on me saying it's done, then look, uh, Troy can't take responsibility for the outcome because he didn't decide what the output was going to be. Now, if your biggest risks are always whether you can deliver this stuff on time or whether you got all that scope, and if the risks aren't really about whether the product will be successful or whether people will use it and love it and it will make money for our company, well, then you're probably the product if you're not aware of those risks. And if you and your team don't actually know the, the real customer, um, or excuse, the real customer and the real outcomes of your work, if you deliver a, a, a product and you don't know if people saw it, try it, used it, and keep using it. Uh, if the outcome is invisible or you're gone by the time the outcome gets generated, you might be a, uh, you're, you're the product. Let me point out one thing. This is a hard pattern to get out from underneath. And if, look, if you are the product and you, and, and you work for, let's say you work for an agency or big firm and you are hired by another customer, I want to tell you how to, there's at least one successful way to be uh, to be the product, but really keep your focus on outcomes. I'm going to draw this. I just drew this continuum here. On one side of the continuum, I'm going to put the word, sorry, um, waiter. And on the other side of the continuum, I'm going to put the word doctor. I need you to bend more towards working like a doctor. What I mean by that is, well, we know how a restaurant works. When you show up at a restaurant, you order food, the, the waiter should listen and be attentive, suggest things to you, bring you everything you ask for. The more food you order, the better. And if you leave having a great dining experience, that's fabulous. Uh, but when you show up at the doctor's office, the first thing your doctor does is to check your KPIs or look at my doctor will check my body temperature, my heart rate, my blood pressure and make me step on a scale and check my weight. Uh, for years, my doctor's been saying I'm way too fat and I need to lose weight and my cholesterol is high. Uh, and doctors, right away, she starts by telling me stuff I don't want to know, uh, telling me stuff about uh, that, that I well, that I don't like to hear. And look, try and give a doctor your list of requirements. Tell them these are the prescriptions I'd like you to write for me or this is the operation I'd like you to schedule. The doctor says, that's nice. Tell me where it hurts. When you say the term outcome to a doctor, they know what it means. It means your health. It means how you're doing. It does not mean how many prescriptions they've written. Look, uh, doctors and real professionals focus more on their customer's outcome. And if you're going to look, if you must work in this uh, this kind of process, be more like a doctor. Help your customers focus on their outcome the same way my my doctor helps me focus on my health. Now, I wanted to finish in time to answer a couple questions. Let's see if I can get this last chunk of stuff through. I'd like to give you a few things you can do uh, right now if you're stuck in this kind of work mode. I wonder how many pictures I can draw here. The, the, the first thing you do is to stop pulling backlog items off of a backlog and actually understand what your products are. Now, uh, just identify your products or give them names if they don't already have one. I think I do want to draw a picture here because this gets hard in big companies. Look, if you were making Spotify or you work for Atlassian and you were building Jira, you 
probably know what your products are. But I work with a lot of companies that are large banks and telcos and things like that. Um, sorry, I'm going to pull back. I have a right heading here. It, understanding what your products are gets a little bit messy. Now, first thing you need to understand is that products are composed of other products. If you have a car or a scooter, it, it's a product. Uh, and if you were to take a wrench or a screwdriver to it and start to take it apart, all those parts are also products. You know, in particular, if you pull off a tire and look at it, it's a product. You can buy it separately. And the brand name on the outside of the tire isn't Toyota or uh, or Honda. It's 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 whoever made the tire. It's a separate product. And when we look at our products that we build for our customers, we have to unpack them. For instance, well, let's, uh, I'm going to call some types of products endpoint uh, products, uh, the, the stuff we sell to our, our, our customers. If we work, let me use a, a bank as an example. If you work for a bank, your endpoint products are things like a, a checking uh, account or a credit card uh, or a, a loan. But look, for me to get a work with a credit card or get a checking account, there are a lot of other products that need to support that. Uh, let's talk about customer supporting products. For instance, if I'm going to work with a credit card, uh, look, I'd like to have a, a website that I that I can learn about the card or sign up for it. I want to have a mobile uh, app that, that lets me do things with that card. Uh, look, uh, there are also employee supporting products. Uh, if I work for the bank and I work in a branch, there are branch uh, applications that allow me to work directly with customers. And uh, if I work in a call center, there are call center apps. And uh, look, all of these are products also. A mobile app is a product, uh, a website is a product, a call center app is a product, but their constituents are there part of this whole customer experience. And then one last type of product that, that ends up being deep inside your organization. I'm going to call this a product team supporting product. And uh, uh, for instance, if I build apps for a bank, uh, look, if I'm building a website for a bank, I'm going to need to have something that allows me to uh, get customer inform show customer information, show current balances, things like that. Same with a mobile app, same with branch apps, same with call center apps. I don't want every one of these product teams to rebuild their same stuff. So we often externalize and we have uh, things like uh, common services or uh, components. Uh, those are products, but well, the primary customer for these common services or components, well, the primary customer is written in the name. It's other product teams. And the other product teams see, try, use, and keep using and say good things about the components. And if they don't, you suck as a, as a product supplier team. You need to be aware of who your customers are. And every one of these kinds of product teams, your, your customers are you know, clearly indicated. Maybe one other thing to point out here is a product, uh, these back-end product team uh, supplying products have a way of drifting outside of your company and they end up becoming, uh, well, uh, partner supporting. Uh, people like Salesforce years ago had an internal framework they used to build their product, but Salesforce's app delifted, del drifted outside, and now people commonly build apps on that force framework. Some of you probably do that for a living today. Uh, 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 work with lots of organizations where what they built here, when they treat it like a product, uh, well, it migrates out here pretty effectively. Understand what your products are. And then once you understand what those products are, now you've got, uh, look, you've got a few things you can do. Uh, first, whoops, sorry, that's not, I've got too many decks open here. The first thing to do is to actually evaluate the success of your products today. What are people seeing and saying about the product you've already got? If you're responsible for the outcomes, 
take some time and understand, well, what's our, what the outcomes you already have are if you ship that product. Is it getting used? What features get used the most, which don't? And you may not have data on these things, but trust your gut or talk to people, gather anecdotal information. Now, I talk about building simple models that help the team understand your product. I uh, build things like simple personas that uh, let people understand who our customers are and what their concerns are. And things like, well, they're like a story map, but a journey map that describes the product we have today and where its problems are. Once you understand your customers, really get to know who, who those customers are. Meet them, talk to them, or uh, talk to other people, at least, that talk to them. Now, I keep using the term customers and users, and we conflate these things all the time. Customers choose a product, users use a product. For consumer applications, they're the same people. The chooser and user are the same people. But look, if you're using Jira in your company, I can guarantee you didn't choose it, but you you use it. You're a, a user. B2B products, users and choosers are separate. Make sure you understand that and well, understand how your customers get value from it and how your users use it and do their jobs with it. Um, all right. Fourth thing here is once you understand your product, what your product is, how it's going now, what your who your customers are and what they want out of it, you're going to find opportunities for improving your product as, as it is. Contemporary products continuously improve. That They don't improve with big fat releases. There's no cool next new version of Spotify coming. There's no next new version of, I don't know what other application, no next, no cool new version of Jira or Trello coming. Rather, they continuously improve with lots of small changes. And product teams are the ones responsible for the outcome. So they, well, they identify their own backlog items, uh, ideally. Look, before you build anything, talk about the expected outcome. Uh, what do we expect? Uh, who will use this functionality? How often will they be more efficient and more effective? And then for extra credit, how would we actually measure if they were? How do we measure who's using it and how often and how fast they can do things or how many errors they make when they're doing it? This sets us up to measure outcomes, not just uh, yeah, this sets us up to measure outcomes. If, now, yeah, that last bullet is uh, you need to understand that the relationship between outcome and impact. Last thing, and I can give you this, see if I can do this in a minute. So we only have five minutes for questions. Um, look, if your, if your organization ships and if you're using an agile process today, I can almost guarantee that at the end of every sprint or iteration, you stop and reflect on your velocity or your quality or how well you did. You'll, you might demonstrate the product and stakeholders might say they like it or that's good, but that's not the outcome. I want you to continuously re reflect on the outcome and impact of everything you deliver. Um, let me draw a, just a very quick model. I, think I can do this in one minute, I'm already too late as it is. If you've got a feature, and remember, a feature isn't a story or isn't a backlog item. It sometimes takes lots of backlog items to build a feature you can release. After you release every feature, look at, stop and talk about the actual effort it took. Meaning if it was small, it took days or uh if it took days or weeks, it's, it's going to float to the left. If it took months, it's going to float into the middle. If it took uh, quarters, it's going to float to the right. Where did things actually end up? Now, you might have predicted things were going to take a few weeks, but they took a few months. And if they were longer than predicted, I'll ask people to note what took longer than we predicted. Of course, they're going to be on the right-hand side. You're going to quickly see that little things are more predictable than big things, just the way it is. But then I want you to look at the actual outcome. Now, everything you ship starts in the don't know category, meaning if I just barely shipped it or haven't shipped it yet, I don't know what the outcome is because I can't measure outcome until things come out. But when users start to see it and try it and use it, you've got a scale here that at the top is awesome, meaning people used it at the rate we thought they loved it. The bottom is uh awful. Uh, uh, people used it, hated it, complained. And in the middle is this uh, uh, meh, 
zone. And the problem is you can't talk about this at the end of every sprint. You, you have to talk about this over time. You may have to wait weeks or months to be able to start getting outcomes and things will start to bubble up or start to move around. The first thing you're going to see or realize is that how long something took has nothing to do with the outcome. Uh, you'll find that little things get awesome outcomes and big things can get awful outcomes. You'll also find that how late something was has nothing to do with the outcome. I can deliver something on time and it can still be awful. I can deliver something uh, late and it can still be awesome. It, there's no correlation between this is the confounding thing. How well you do at this has very little to do with how well you do at that outcome thing. Being product centric shifts your focus to those outcomes. And look, I'm hoping you can start to smell you know, what I mean by this and start to feel it inside your organization. Product thinking moves your focus to outcomes, the success of the product you're creating and improving, uh, not just the effort it took to do it. it don't mistake being a good service provider, being reliable and dependable and, and delivering what you said you would for being a good product developer. They're not the same thing. And your company succeeds when its product succeeds. Uh, Look, if your product is a service like uh, my friend Troy, he's going to be successful when he is uh, is reliable and does all those right things. But hey, if you work for a company that actually builds a product, uh, look, it's going to succeed when your customers actually use your products and love those things. All right, I blew it. Uh, only two, maybe time for one question, if that. But uh, that's all I've got here. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. That was uh, really great. Uh, you can see the likes. Uh, they're, they're, they're hitting about 10K mark. Uh, we'll see if we can cross that. Uh, I think people were so busy in uh, in listening that I don't see many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I talk so fast. Uh, I hope they uh, got anything out of that. Yeah, if there's, uh, and again, I was hoping to end a little bit earlier, but there may be time for one if there was. Uh, yeah, there are two questions. Let's uh, give it a shot. I'll. Uh, do, do you want to look at it, or do you want me to? Oh, I, I'm scam looking at it right now, and I'm seeing lots of thank you for the thanks. Uh, I don't see any questions in there. You see the Q and A on the top. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm looking at the. Uh, ah, there we go. Yeah, the, well, well, I'll just start from the top. Sometimes the product owner or product manager doesn't work closely with the development team and prefers to be outside. Uh, what can we say to them that will we'll convert them sooner rather than later? Now, look, I teach product ownership and the stuff I'm talking to you about, I, uh, I make sure you know, one of the things I could have – uh, I really emphasize your job as a product owner is to be a leader of a product team, to be a strong collaborator and to not separate the team off as a service provider. So I want them to smell it. So it is bad behavior. But if you're a team member on that team, if you just go back to those questions I ended with, if you're asked to build a backlog item, look, one of the things that's supposed to be coming through in our user stories is who they're for and what benefit they'll get. And next time you're in a backlog refinement session, ask, uh, uh, we're building a story, who is it for, how are they going to benefit, and how would we measure success? Uh, by success, I mean they're going to use it, how would we measure how frequently they're going to use it, and what do we expect? Keep moving the discussion to outcomes. Now, this can be a little upsetting sometimes. Your product owner may not know the outcomes if they are acting as a service provider for the business and the business didn't tell them. Um, so it can be a little uncomfortable, but all you can do is keep moving the discussion to, you know, to what, just ask what happens when things come out and how would we measure success? That's, that's all I've got. And I'm worried about time. We need to, uh, we can take a couple of more uh, nah. minutes. That's okay. Jim. Um, and I'm such a slow reader, man. And the questions are starting to come in here. Uh, it, anybody? Yeah, that one I of the. I can read out the next one. So, yeah, if you from don't this mind. session, it becomes clear. Yeah, from this session, it becomes clear that product slash outcome approach is so beneficial. Uh, so I wonder why organizations don't follow it everywhere. Also, at organization level, are there any challenges that come inbuilt uh, with the implementation that maybe is hindering or missing? The, 
Oh, I don't know if I've, that's a, that's a tough question. Uh, I've been, the, the first part of the question I've been pondering for years. If this is so obvious, why doesn't everybody do it? The, the, my gut is that people are much more familiar with this pattern of business. Uh, everybody's heard mantras like the customer is always right. Everybody's heard uh, the notion that the other people inside of our company are customers. And when everybody, anybody asks you to do something, you're a customer and, your company really did hire you and pays you to do work. And so it does feel like we're a contractor. Uh, we've fallen. This is more of a common pattern. The way traditional management works, uh, management job is to tell people what to do and uh, to measure how well they did what they said they were going to do. Uh, I think, I, I believe the reason it's so prevalent is this is a much more common pattern. But I think people... Um, People are losing the plot now. Um, yeah, yeah. The, oh gosh, the, it's too big of a question. The, you know, the the way organizations are trying to move themselves away from this is to really start to make outcomes visible. Things like OKRs and metrics, things like that, do that. Those are the only only way to move it. Naresh, you're about to interrupt me. I didn't. I think I. So, so, sorry, Jeff. I just wanted to add there that uh, the, the question is really interesting, and one of my uh, insights have been that you know being a product and an outcome centric organization is taking more risk than many organizations have appetite for the services yeah. kind of a thing that you get paid for time is a much less riskier business if you will it, it's, does that make sense it does and one of the oh gosh i, I, I was hunting for a quote it's it's riskier it's it's uh, if i can tell you what uh, to build and check to see if you did what you said you were going to do that's something as a leader as a manager as a business i can measure that's something i can wrap governance around i can i can say did you do what you said you're going to do uh, look but if you thought predicting how long it's going to take to do something is hard try predicting how successful the thing you built is uh, these outcome things are a lot less predictable they're hard and the annoying thing about outcomes is they take a long time to measure once you just once you ship something uh, you can uh, once you finish building something you can evaluate the quality of what you build you can always evaluate time cost and scope one of the reasons I'll ask people to visualize outcomes is one of the things I'll start to notice is it takes a while. If you work for Atlassian and you were building features for Jira, to know if people keep using your Jira feature is going to take two to six sprints and in actual calendar time. That's going to be months or a minimum, of, well, a minimum a month, but one to three months is common. That's measuring outcomes sucks and measuring impact or return on investment even even longer term we end up drawing our focus to outputs because those are the things we can see and control a little bit better but they're not how your business makes money that's the that's the the hard part um i'm i'm left with these uh conundrums um of how we change that but uh, you know, I think perfectly, you know, good, well-meaning people kind of just fall into this trap. But I'm rambling. Uh, do we have time for another okay. question? Jeff, uh, I, I, I don't know how, how to thank you, but uh, this is such a wonderful talk mm -hmm. and such an important talk. Uh, you know, I wish a uh, lot more people, uh, you know, pay attention to the uh, to, to this uh, distinction that you draw. Uh, and and it's uh, it's really great. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. I know it was really early for you. I, you were up at four thirty in the morning. <laughs> so yeah. really appreciate that. Not a problem. I'm happy to do it. Uh, thank you, everyone. All for right. Nice to be there. <laughs> bye bye.